Hi there, welcome to this video on silicate minerals in Bowen's reaction series. Minerals are incredibly important. As a geologist, I love them because of course they make up rocks, but they also help us learn about and record the history of past plate tectonics. For example, we use uranium lead dating of the mineral zircon to tell the age of rocks. We also look at the chemistry of metamorphic rocks like garnet to learn about what was going on inside of ancient mountain belts like the Himalaya or the Adirondacks. So although minerals record Earth history with faithful detail, they're also incredibly important resources for our global community. For example, you might know that the element lithium is in very high demand because of lithium ion batteries. And over the last two or three years, the price of lithium has essentially quadrupled as demand has risen. So this creates the question, where are lithium bearing minerals available on Earth? What types of minerals are there? And how hard is it to process those lithium bearing minerals into a pure lithium extract that could be used in production? So this is where a lot of geology comes into play. Where are the minerals? and why are they occurring in certain forms. So in this video, I want to teach you the basics of minerals so you can understand how they relate to resources and also start to understand how they record Earth history. So in this video, we're going to look at four things. We'll start out talking about silicate versus non-silicate minerals. Then we'll do a tutorial on bonding in basic silicate structures. And then we'll wrap everything up in terms of an idea called the Bowen's Reaction Series that predicts what order certain minerals should crystallize in from a magma. And then I'll finish by showing you how fractional crystallization of minerals within a magma can actually control the composition of the resulting rock. So as a quick review, what are minerals? In our previous video, we defined them as crystalline solids that form in the natural environment that have a repeating crystal structure and a constant composition throughout. And it's this constant composition and repeating structure that really distinguish them from rocks. In fact, minerals are the building blocks of rocks. And although you might often visualize them as something you've seen in a museum, like a gem quality mineral, of course, most minerals are just unglamorous, dirty parts of rock. But if you concentrate a certain mineral in rock high enough, for example, this bright red rock is actually concentrated in the mineral hematite, which is an iron oxide, then that rock may actually become an important economic ore. In this case, the mineral hematite is essentially being mined to use as a source of iron ore. And so as we think about the different value of minerals, we want to divide them into two main groups, silicate minerals and non-silicate minerals. Silicate minerals are key because they make up 99.9% .9 of earth materials, including our entire mantle, which is peridotite rock. Non-silicate minerals are less common, but they may be more interesting, and they're often very important for resources. So we're not going to cover non-silicates further in this class, but I'll just show you quickly this table of some famous non-silicate minerals. For example, carbonates that have a CO3 group, halides that have often a chlorine or a fluorine group, the oxides, the sulfides, sulfates. So some famous examples you might know. Uh, we just mentioned the iron oxide hematite. Um, Calcium carbonate is another mineral we'll see a lot in this class. That's uh, the mineral calcite. It's a building block for limestone. Um, sodium chloride here is common table salt. So a lot of these minerals are, are quite important. But now let's leave those behind and move into talking about bonding and the idea of silicate structures. So from here on out, we're only going to focus on silicate minerals. So the story of silicate minerals really begins in a magma chamber. This is a hot liquid magma chamber and essentially consists of a pool of unbonded atoms, 
things like silica, oxygen, sodium, essentially floating around in this magma looking to bond. And so as the magma begins to cool, the thermal energy subsides enough that bonds can begin to for form between the atoms. Essentially, they can start to share electrons and assemble minerals by bonding specific atoms. And that bonding is governed by the electronegativity of elements. And I'll review this quickly. You might remember from high school chemistry that each element, for example, potassium, has some number of electrons orbiting around its nucleus. And those electrons can be thought of as falling into orbital shells. Here's an inner shell that has two electrons. Here's an intermediate shell that has eight electrons. And it's quite often the case, especially for the lower mass elements, that they would love to have eight electrons in their outer orbital shell. But because they're all different, most elements don't have eight. For example, potassium only has one electron in its outer shell. Now, because it would like to get back to a condition of having eight, it's essentially looking to give this electron away or share some of this electric charge. Elements that are looking to give away electric charge, like potassium, are called cations. Okay, And we denote them usually with a positive symbol. In contrast, elements that have a deficit of electrons and are looking to acquire would be called anions. Okay, And this fundamentally controls the pattern of bonding. Essentially, opposites attract. Cations and anions like to get together because the cation wants to give charge away and the anion wants to receive that charge. So this chart is called an electron dot diagram, and it shows a summary of some of the important cations and anions. And it, it shows their chemical symbol with a dot next to it, indicating how many extra electrons are in that outer orbital shell, and thus whether it's a cation or an anion. For example, sodium has one dot. It has one electron in its outer shell. That means it's a plus one cation. It wants to give away one unit of charge. Magnesium right next to it has two dots. It has two electrons in its outer shell. It wants to give away two units of electric charge. So we think of magnesium in this case as being a more powerful cation than sodium. It's because it has two units of charge to give away, it's a little more desperate to do that. And it's the same deal over on this side. Here's oxygen, which is missing two electrons and is desperate to get those two, whereas fluorine's only missing one. So this is a nice summary if you ever wonder about cations and anions. So now let's get back to this magma chamber. We've got things like silica and oxygen, some of the most abundant elements on Earth. The chamber's cooling down. They're looking to pair off and bond. The first thing that happens is we start to form what are called silica tetrahedra. This is the basic building block of all silicate minerals. And what happens is we get a silica plus four cation bonding with four oxygens, which are minus two anions, okay? And for a number of reasons, this is a very stable configuration, and it involves these very common elements. However, this molecule, this silica tetrahedra, has a net charge of minus four. Essentially, these oxygens are bringing too much negative charge to the table. They're overwhelming the silica to give a net charge of minus four. Now, molecules want to be balanced. They want to have a net charge of zero. So how can we balance out this charge? The way to do it is to start to form more complicated crystal structures that incorporate other plus two cations and that are going to create a neutral charge. And so this brings us to our first mineral, olivine, Mg2SiO4. What we're going to do is we're going to bring in two magnesium atoms that each have a charge of plus two, and it's going to give us a net charge of zero across this molecular structure. And, it's going to, and the result of repeating that structure is the mineral olivine. Now, as temperatures continue to drop, what happens is that 
oxygens begin to be shared between the silica tetrahedra, and that reduces the negative charge. See what I mean. These little pyramids are representations of silica tetrahedra with an oxygen at each corner. And as we, as we get more complicated, we start to share oxygens at the corner. There's only one oxygen here instead of two. Okay, they're sharing it. And as they start to do this, we start to build more complicated silicate structures. So where olivine was essentially an isolated silicate structure, basically a bunch of tetrahedra with magnesium and iron between them, pyroxenes are single chains. We've started to aggregate these silica tetrahedra into a chain connected each one by one corner. And we're also, again, going to bring in some of these cations to balance out the charge. But the key idea is that because we're sharing oxygens, we actually have less oxygen overall, which means less negative charge, which means that we, can, we need fewer cations to actually start to balance out that charge. And so now, as the magma continues to cool, eventually we actually run out of those plus two cations. We literally don't have any more magnesium and iron to use up. And what happens is we then force these silicate structures to start sharing more and more oxygens at their corners, which further reduces the net negative charge. And it allows us to start balancing that net negative charge using weaker cations, like potassium plus one and sodium plus one. So here's an example of a sheet silicate, also known as mica, in which a lot each tetrahedra is sharing three oxygens. Okay, So we've wildly reduced the amount of oxygen here, which means we can balance that charge out with elements like potassium plus one. Eventually, the limit of all this is called a framework silicate structure, something like quartz or feldspar, in which essentially every oxygen is shared. The tetrahedra are arranged in these complicated three-dimensional structures where all the oxygens are being shared. And in this case, quartz actually has such efficient sharing of oxygens that the formula SiO2 is balanced without needing any cations at all. The silica plus four balances the two negative twos of the oxygen. And the key idea here in all of this, or another key idea, is that as we start to share these oxygens, these more complex minerals become more and more felsic. And that's because they essentially have more silica and less oxygen. So they get a higher silica to oxygen ratio. And also, we know we're using things like potassium and sodium, which are those felsic cations. So let's look now at Bowen's reaction series, which essentially wraps up and encapsulates all of these ideas in a single model. So here's what Bowen's reaction series shows. Imagine we're, crisp, we're, we're cooling the magma chamber from high temperature to low temperature, okay? And we just talked about how the first minerals to form are the simple isolated tetrahedra, like olivine. So if we have, these can only form if we have magnesium and iron available. We must have those strong plus two cations available to balance the charge, okay? So if we do have that available, olivine will, will form, right? And the same with pyroxene. It also relies on a lot of these plus two cations because there's not much oxygen sharing going on. Now eventually, as we start to consume the plus two cations, we run out of magnesium and iron. We force the more complex silicates to form, things like feldspar, mica, and quartz. So these are frameworks and sheet silicates, um, and we're able to use those plus ones, and the minerals generally become more felsic. So essentially what this does is it predicts the order in which minerals will crystallize as a function of the decreasing temperature and the changing chemistry of the magma. So olivine will always crystallize at high temperature, 
and things like quartz won't start crystallizing until much lower temperatures. But one key idea is this. If certain elements aren't available at a given temperature, nothing will crystallize. So for example, if your melt or your magma doesn't have magnesium and iron to begin with, then we can't make olivine. And essentially the magma will continue to cool and stay as a liquid because nothing is able to crystallize. And things won't start crystallizing until we get down into a lower temperature where we can start to utilize some of our plus one cations. So we don't have to crystallize all these minerals. And often we won't unless, unless we have the exact right chemistry. Now, what happens in the end of all this is depending on your initial composition of your magma, you're either going to be left with a rock that tends to be mafic, for example, if you mostly crystallized out these mafic minerals, or one that might be felsic if you mostly crystallized out things like quartz and feldspar. And so we can go back to a previous chart that you've seen before and show this exact idea. Mafic rocks tend to crystallize from magmas or melts that are rich in iron, magnesium, calcium. And they have, silic they have simpler silicate minerals, things like olivine and pyroxene. Okay? Felsic rocks are richer in sodium, potassium, and silica. They tend to be dominated by these more complex silicate minerals here, okay? which crystallize later in the series. And as a result, they're richer in potassium and sodium, more of these plus one cations, whereas the mafix are rich in iron, magnesium, calcium, more of these plus two cations. Okay, so now you know how igneous rocks form and what controls their chemistry. I want to close this video out with a bit on fractional crystallization. And fractional crystallization is the idea that we can actually get two or more rock types out of a single magma chamber. Because what happens is that we start with a magma, and as it cools, we start to crystallize out maybe mafic minerals, like olivine or pyroxene. Those can settle to the bottom and create a mafic rock. But the key idea is that the magma they leave behind is now depleted in iron, magnesium, calcium. So as this remaining magma cools, it's going to crystallize mostly felsic minerals, like quartz and feldspar. And as those crystallize and settle, they may make a completely different rock type, um, which is directly in contact with the original one. Here's an example of that. This is a single igneous rock, where the bottom layer is made of a mafic gabbro that crystallized early and settled, and the upper rock type is a felsic granite that's made from minerals that crystallized later in the process. And I'll close the video by reaching back to our motivating example of the element lithium as an earth resource. In addition to lithium carbonate minerals, a major resource for lithium is the silicate mineral spodumene. And spodumene is mostly found in what are called pegmatite dikes. Here's a set of beautiful pegmatite dikes cutting through a gabbro near Ticonderoga, New York. These pegmatite dikes are ultra felsic, they're very rich in silica, and they're very rich in incompatible elements like lithium. Because these dikes are essentially the last bit of magma left as a liquid during fractional crystallization. So everything else that has cooled has taken all of the more common elements with it and crystallized them out. And we're left behind with just a lot of silica and weird incompatible elements that didn't fit into a crystal structure, things like lithium. Ultimately, those things are forced to form into rare, strange minerals like spodumene. And that can be a resource for some incompatible elements like lithium. So in summary, we've shown that minerals and rocks are a major global resource. Silicate minerals make up most of Earth, but non-silicates tend to be more important as global resources. 
silicate minerals begin to crystallize as elements start to bond in a cooling magma. And the first things that crystallize are silica tetrahedra. These are the building blocks for all silicate minerals. Bowen's reaction series is a handy framework to predict how minerals will crystallize from a magma. It predicts that simple crystal structures crystallize first using stronger plus two cations like iron and magnesium to balance their charge. It predicts that late silicate structures share a lot of oxygens, which reduces the negative charge and allows them to balance out their molecular charge using weaker plus one cations like sodium and potassium. As a result, some of those early mineral structures that form are mafic and are rich in iron, magnesium, calcium, and have low silica to oxygen. The late structures are felsic, tend to be rich in sodium, potassium, and have a high silica to oxygen ratio. We then finished the video with this idea of fractional crystallization and showed how we can actually change the composition of a magma chamber as early mineral structures start to form and remove those plus two cations into solid crystals, which sink and leave the re remaining magma more felsic. Thanks a lot for listening, and here's a few concept questions.